special branch on MI6 officer and the author of Black Ops. If you'd like to help Carlton keep producing the Black Spy podcast and receive episodes and information that's only available to Carlton's special Patreon agents, then you can donate as little as £3, €4 or $5 a month by signing up with Patreon. See the Black Spy podcast notes or Google Patreon Black Spy podcast and pledge your monthly amount. You can even win the opportunity to be a guest on the show. Thanks for listening and don't forget to subscribe for free. My name is Carlton King and welcome to the Black Spy podcast. The show which shines a light on the hitherto hidden world of secret intelligence, national security and armed governmental personal protection operations. And more importantly, where it connects that world with the world of geopolitics. That's the world that surrounds you, that controls basically your life and how it functions. So what I want to do with the show, and, and, and I've been doing now for the last three seasons, is to bring on guests who live in that world, which you may not see, but which has a great impact upon how you live. And today's guest is no exception to that. Today's guest is Matthew Harrowing, who works within the world of data and Bitcoin and all of that type of stuff, which actually is taking a great um, yeah, impact on your lives, whether you know it or not. And what we're going to do is discuss with Matthew how that is actually happening. So, Matthew, thank you very much for coming on the show, my friend. It's my pleasure, Carlton, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Matthew, um, without any further ado, could you just tell me how you got into this sort of world of data and crypto and blockchains and all this sort of thing that for many people, they've heard of it, but don't understand anything about it at all? Sure. So uh, I've been a technologist my, my whole career. Uh, I, I actually love technology since I was 12 years old. And uh, of course, back then, growing up in the UK, that made you uh, um, a popular kid, um, as I'm sure you could imagine. Um, so al always really had a passion for IT and data and uh, um, was able to pursue that. My studies and had some wonderful uh, early starts in my career and some great mentors. How I got into the world of blockchain, specifically in cryptocurrency, uh, was really a, a kind of around the garden's route. So um, I, I came across blockchain many, many years ago and uh, was completely dismissive of it. And of course, you know, I'd be truly retired now if I listened to uh, my <laughs> friends and family saying I should should have bought it but when I when I looked into the technology I thought yes it's it's good technology but I can't see mass adoption and then when the adoption started it was particularly uh, prevalent in the criminal world and I thought to myself why would I ever want to uh, associate a professional career um, by dipping my toe in that world and so I, I was dismissive I thought the criminal the criminal world uh, tend to find something to trade, whether it's uh, diamonds or gold or, you know, washing powder, or whatever the, the latest fad is. And I thought this would be a, a fad uh, that, that wouldn't last and obviously was proved uh, wrong. Um, around about uh, 2017, uh, I was working at one of the big four, uh, Ernst & Young, who were pioneers and some of the leaders in this field. And uh, again, having some wonderful mentors, had a chance to really get into the power of the technology and led uh, one of the first uh, intersections between accounting and blockchain, developing um, a, an intercompany accounting solution using blockchain. Um, and since then, I've just marveled at the innovation and 
and growth of this space and how it's just transforming so many areas of business. Well, Matthew, this is this this is fantastic. The first bit that you said that really truly rang a bell with me was that around about 2013, um, yeah, it'd be about 2013 around that era, 2012, 2013, somebody came to me and said, listen, I was about you putting some money into this thing called Bitcoin. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and, yep. and, and I looked at it a little bit and the fellow explained it to me and I didn't know whether what he was saying was correct or wasn't correct because, you know, I'm, I, I wasn't in that field. But the thing that I knew about it from was exactly what you said. I knew about this type of, um, and I didn't know what it was really, this type of thing being done in the world of um, terror, the world of, of, of crime. So I thought, hmm, this is the dark web type of stuff, you, you know. But then he said, no, 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 this is, this is sort of some kind of new currency going to change the world. So I said, ah, and he explained it. And I thought, this is a Ponzi scheme. People will put their money in the next minute, the who, person who's doing this. And, and, of course, he spoke about some guy who was some kind of, um, you know, Satoshi, some kind of guy who nobody knows who he is and all this sort of business. It just sounded all crazy. So I said to myself, I'm not putting anything in this, right? And we're only talking about a thousand pounds, five thousand pounds, something like that. You know, it's a lot of money to me, but not to a lot of people. I now realize <laughs> that had I even put just a thousand pounds in, oh, I'd now be yes. a multi multi millionaire, you know. So that's how smart I was. Um, so, yeah, your, your story just rang with me. And I thought to myself, how many people must have made that mistake, you know, in the beginning? So it's going to be interesting to see what you say about what happens going forward with this and, and how this might change the world, which is what you were saying. Well, I, I, I think in fairness, a lot of us made the uh, uh, initial assumption based on who was using it. I mean, I didn't particularly want to invest in a market that was so so shady, um, and and I still hold true today. I, I I'm you know, Bitcoin is something that um, I I respect and admire, but I think actually I'm more of a fan of some of the other chains and what you can do with them. So right. for me, the, the the passion isn't around uh, let's get rich quick. It's more around how can we use this wonderful technology to do things differently. And, and really improve on how we communicate, how we work, uh, and how we, we spread and record value across the world. So I, I'm passionate about blockchain. I will tell you now, I hold lots of different cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin is not one of them. And right. I still can't bring myself to, uh, to jump into that game. And I, I there, you'll have people writing in saying, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> And I've been told that for years and years and years. I continue to to um, appreciate what it's being used for as a store of value, and maybe I'll get into it uh, when I when I see it um, legitimately as a store of value. But I'm passionate about the technology. I'm I'm enthused by it, and and I'm not in it to to try and make money. I'm in it to try and actually do interesting things with it. So Matthew, can I just can I just keep you on the Bitcoin stroke cryptocurrencies mm. for a while? Because um, you know, even in sleepy little towns in Britain, you know, guys and gals are are, are getting into predominantly Bitcoin and then other cryptocurrencies and, and and saying, oh, I've made this or I've lost this or whatever it might be. So I think it behooves us just to stay a little bit on that for a while, just to get your feel as to why you're not going into Bitcoin. And and and, and also I, for me to say straight up front, I understand what you're saying because years and years ago when I had something to do with um, Colombia from the perspective of narco-terrorism, obviously with everything, uh, on, on the Pablo Escobar, and he was killing, you know, literally thousands of people uh, um, and, and, and holding the, the Colombian state for ransom. But the point is his money movement was his problem. So he was, and, and it is true that he was digging holes in the ground and, and putting money in. And it's also true to say that he dug holes in the ground and nobody knows where the money is. You know, so some farmer might dig up a hole and have, you know, millions or tens of millions of pounds there. 
in Colombia somewhere because he, he just didn't know what to do with the money. Um, now, of course, he put it all into political campaigns and put it into building up Medellin and all this. And in other cities, Cali and, and, and not so much Cali, but more Bogota, places like that. And obviously, uh, Miami is built on, you know, this, this type of money. So, but now, explain to me how it becomes, and the view, the listeners, how it becomes easier in using Bitcoin to do that mm. rather than using US generally US currency, US dollar, because, you know, there's an argument that says, well, we don't want Bitcoin because it can be used criminally. Well, the US dollar is used criminally, you know. Oh, as oh, any I, couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. Yes. Um, now, and interestingly, so, so just to be clear, I hold cryptocurrencies. I just happen to uh, think that Ethereum will flip Bitcoin into the dominance. That's so for me, it's about choosing the technology uh, platform that I think will ultimately uh, um, dominate the uh, business and uh, uh, banking and uh, personal finance world. And, and so for me, it's a technology choice rather mm. than a moral choice at this okay. stage. Now, there's, there's nothing wrong with, with hedging your bets and going on, on both sides. But, but there's, you know, with, in terms of real use cases, then uh, uh, Ethereum is by far the leader. Right. And so even though there is huge value in Bitcoin, um, it's, it, it, my bias towards it was initially formed in terms of its use cases. Now, uh, it's wonderful. It's, it's fabulous tech. It's being used legitimately. I just happen to uh, prefer uh, a different... Different when approach. do you think the flip will happen if it comes? Have you got any, I, I, you know, feel for that flip? Uh, again, your your switchboard is going to explode. So <laughs> I, I would say I would say this year. Um, You'd say this year? Now, wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if we look, I mean, let's look at the market cap of crypto now. Yeah. Um, so 2019, it was 131 billion. Mm -hmm. That was January 2019. So, mm -hmm. so really amazing market. If we think of looking at, you know, where are we going to invest? Well, that's a big market. However, you know, January 2020, that was 195 billion. That's decent growth. By December of 2020, we're 2.8 trillion. Yes, yes. So yes. in one year, the size of the British economy. Yes. And correct. This has appeared out of nowhere, and and well, you know, some may argue whether it really has. But the the, the this vibrant uh, uh, area of innovation uh, that's occurring within blockchain, uh, just creating all these new economies and new approaches. Mm. So, so I think I think when I look at where the growth has occurred in terms of innovation, it's been in Ethereum, and yeah. why I think it will flip it. Ethereum is getting better. There's a foundation, uh, it has a governance that is very democratic, and people can do a lot with it. The difference, of course, between Ethereum and Bitcoin at the moment is that I can write smart contracts. I can put a piece of code into Ethereum that it does stuff. And because I can see that code and I can read the mathematics behind that code, I can trust that code. And I, I, so I I'd, I'd, like, I'd like you... To hold steady, because I want you to actually go into smart contracts fully, if you will, because I just want to just keep on the coins for just one second and, and the areas, because I know that Cardano example, a lot of people love that better than Ethereum. Mm. Why would you say Ethereum? Because they're saying Cardano is actually even better. Hoskinson, who yeah, I listened to, yeah. he, he used to be in with, uh, what's he called, But Butters, who, who's Ethereum, he used to be together. And he says he's built on top of that to make it even superior. So he can do many, many more transactions when he gets it going than Ethereum can. Is that true? And, and, and is, oh, is it just battles of words? Because what I don't understand, and I think what many people who look a little bit at it like me, don't really understand the technology behind it. So when these guys are saying, mine is better than yours, we don't really know what's what. That's why you're so important, because you can see the, the, if you will, the gummings inside the television, whereas we don't. So can you explain why you think Cardano can't make, or Polygon, or any of these things can't make the flip over Ethereum? Uh, it's a great question. And uh, we're, we're making an assumption that most of your listeners uh, understand how blockchain works. Would you like me to dive into that? Please do, because, because we okay. don't. And I don't, and we don't. Right. So that'd be fantastic. 
Hey, uh, uh, I mean, the quick answer to that is grab a teenager or a millennial and, uh, <laughs> and that, you know, Great. give them a pint and, and you'll be an expert. So um, uh, effectively, uh, you know, blockchain solves a problem of information imbalance. So, you know, why do we have errors? Because we have two systems that have a different uh, view of what, what the actual event uh, was. So, you know, putting it in simple forms, um, if I raise an invoice and uh, you raise an invoice, unless they're exactly the same, um, we're going to have a mismatch. So blockchain solves so you're the problem. Saying it's a ledger. You're saying it's basically an accounting ledger. It's saying? a distributed ledger. Uh, so putting it on its simplest terms, it is a distributed ledger. Now, uh, very cleverly, you have a wallet and that wallet holds a currency, a cryptocurrency, and I transfer that cryptocurrency to another wallet and the, and the uh, ledger mathematically says, okay, you held that, you own that cryptocurrency, that is yours, I can see it, and you have transa you've transacted and, and we can see it's gone and transferred across, we're going to make a recording of that and every... Uh, uh, instance of the blockchain ledger is going to agree that that transaction happened and then we're going to, well, the majority, and then we're going to post it immutably so that it could never be altered. So one of the right. powerful aspects about a blog, uh, blockchain is that the various uh, nodes, as we call them, mm -hmm. have to agree, the majority have to agree that that transaction really occurred the way it, it did. And then it's posted immutably and can never be changed. Matthew, now, I've simplified. So, sorry, Matthew. What are these nodes? Because you hear that a lot, nodes. But what are they? Said so effectively, think of them as uh, copies of the ledger that yeah. sit on a specific server. And um, ah, so, and like they're like a book. Then they're themselves. like the book of the ledger. Is that what you're saying? So think of it. Yeah, exactly. So think of it that you go to the pub with your four mates and. Um, and you know, every night you're sharing rounds, mm -hmm. and at the end of the evening, you know, you Venmo each other the cash, and you're incurring lots and lots of expenses. It's a bit of a pain to do. So, wouldn't it be easy if you and your four mates just had a shared online ledger where you could record who bought the round? Gotcha. And so you start to share that, but unfortunately, you know, at the end of the month, Timothy's copy of the ledger, and you each have your own copy, Timothy you know, hasn't been as generous as, say, the rest of you, and he decides to to try and alter his ledger, and the rest of you just don't agree, and you're like, Timothy, come on. That's not how it went. And so the way this works is that each of you sign your version of the ledgers, and the ledgers all reconcile, and so when Timothy tries to be, you know, dodgy, uh, you, you know he's trying it on again. Mm -hmm. And now what we're able to do in a distributed fashion is use mathematics to verify the transaction that one, they held the asset, two, the transaction occurred and the, the, the asset moved. And this is doing this in a split second or less than a split second? Subject to the blockchain you're using, yes. It, right. uh, you can store multiple transactions, individual transactions. You can store pretty much uh, anything. So. Um, a blockchain is a record of transactions. It is both a network um, and it's also a ledger. So I hear a lot about decentralized. Is this where this comes in? Because nobody can grab hold of it and say, I'm going to change all the ledgers, all the nodes. I'll just change them all because I want to. What Are we saying that because it's in many different places, no one person, no one government, no one system, um, I'm thinking intelligence agency, whatever, can change that to their good. Is that what you're saying? Or yeah, is it more exactly. Complex? So, so um, well, it's decentralized in, in several ways. So firstly, it's, um, you don't have a central uh, verification uh, unit. So the, the verification occurs in a decentralized fashion. So think back to the pub uh, situation when you, mm -hmm. um, you transfer the cash. You, you go through a bank and the bank says, yep, he has the money deposited with us. We are now going to transfer that on to whomever. And so the bank acts as an intermediary. Well, with blockchain, we, we all have our own assets and we all have our own information. 
So we don't need an intermediary. So, so we get rid of that middle person who charges us a fee for making that transaction. Yeah. So we're, we're decentralized in how we're uh, verifying transactions and we're decentralized by uh, security because we each have a copy of the ledger and we, and we have to come to a consensus that the copy we have is accurate. And if we have enough people participating with copies of the ledgers, then it becomes mathematically improbable to ever alter what has occurred. So it gives a deep sense of security and comfort knowing that there isn't a middle party who can who can uh, alter things to their benefit. Now, unfortunately, Matthew, you said two or three things which are subversive. First and foremost, <laughs> you're suggesting that banks are not required. And that in itself is something that I would imagine um, every state will find absolutely prob problematic for the pure and simple reason that politicians are orientated to the banking system probably more than any other system. Well, bank and commerce, let's say, probably more than any other system, pure and simply because that's what gives them the leeway to do what they need to do within their states in terms of money, because we all need it and governments need it. So they are going to be massively hedging against this and, and putting effort in to prevent this from coming into place, are they not? So uh, for those people who are vested in maintaining the status quo uh, by using uh, their banking system as a lever of power, they will find this challenging. However, for those people who are uh, believers that um, uh, the appropriate use of, of capital can unlock uh, innovation, uh, generate huge wealth for uh, its citizens, and uh, can transform their economies no matter where they are in the world, then they won't be challenged by this. And we're starting to see this, uh, you know, all over the world. We have some of the more traditional economies who are doing their best to create regulation, but just not quick enough to try and control the spread of this. But, but the reality is it's decentralized. Hmm. I can spin up a, a, a node and, and participate from, from wherever. Anyone who's got a laptop or a mobile phone or a PC anywhere in the world and access to the internet can participate in this in this global system. So, mm. so I think it's really a matter of perception. I think if if I was uh, pulling the levers of power, I would do absolutely what I could to participate in a meaningful way uh, for the betterment of the, the the people I supported and also you know my currency, country and 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 currency. See, I can see that what happens here. Um, and I don't want to go too sort of ephemeral on, on, on this, but, but, I, but I can see what happens here is that um, vested interests of power. Yes, if you're El Salvador, you can say, I'll have Bitcoin tomorrow. Not a problem because you've got no power because you're not in the system. So anything that undermines the current system for you is good. And I would say that goes the same for, you know, Ethiopia, which I know is doing something with Cardano or whatever. Right. So you can do that because might give you a leg up in a new system. But if you're the United States, and this was articulated extremely clearly by Trump, I haven't heard the present president say much on it, but Trump was very, very clear. And his words are dead simple. I don't like anything that undermines in any way, shape or means the dollar. Right? That's what he said. Uh, I don't know if you know that quote yourself. And, and, and the reason why I would suggest is that Right now, the United States can print trillions of dollars. It can be in hock to trillions upon trillions of dollars, which it is. Yeah. And nobody is going to pull that plug and say, you need to pay up, which is what they do with third world countries. So you're bankrupt. World Bank's coming in. It's going to sort you out. You can't do that with the US because you destroy the whole system. Now, if the dollar isn't the currency of hold, I'll use that terminology because it's not a, a, like a gold standard or something, but the currency of hold, then, of course, you might be able to start saying, the US, you're living beyond your means. You know, why are you spending more money on your military than the next 20 countries below you put together and thereby bankrupting your system? 
Do you see what I'm saying? It changes the whole system. Uh, it does. Um, it does bring some uh, oversight and some uh, uh, peer pressure and governance to how people manage their own economies. The uh, the external pressure, albeit tiny at the moment and inconsequential, yes, yes. Um, uh, is still, you know, the size of of a very large economy and mm -hmm. growing rapidly. Now, mm -hmm. will it impact the the U.S. dominance? I personally don't believe so because the number one used coin in cryptocurrency is the U.S. dollar backed stable coins. Yes. Okay. So when, when we're swapping in and out of cryptocurrencies on chain and off chain, we typically use the US dollar. So if anything, it's actually providing. So you think the US is co-opting the system to itself? Is that what you basically I, I, saying? I know. I think the, the, the market has driven this one. The market's um, co-opting it. I, okay. Yeah. And I don't see any change to that. But but again, you know, if, we have, if we're going to have a global currency, well, let's have a facility to enable people who don't generally have access to it to, to participate. Mm -hmm. Many of these countries are experiencing huge hyperinflation. Absolutely. So the ability for someone to be able to switch their domestic currency to a stable currency, regardless of whether it's the US dollar or pounds, using their mobile phone with very low transaction uh, fees, not, not only empowers uh, uh, the, the economies of those particular areas, but, but also underpins the world with a more stable approach. The, the, the whole point of having these currencies pit against each other and um, creates as winners or losers, yeah. uh, you know, obviously we have corporations that, that suffer from this and, and it creates risk, but it's the people. You, you know, if I'm getting paid in a particular currency that's, that's suffering from hyperinflation, then I should be given a, an ability to, to peg that and, and have something a bit more stable. Matthew, I'm so, with you. I, I, I think this is a fantastic idea, um, whoever put it together initially and, and the people who've worked on it since to expand this and put it together. I think it's brilliant. And I think that the cryptocurrency, if you give it its legs, uh, um, could actually be good for the world. My problem is I know how people think in my industry and they'll be seeing and looking at this and thinking, you know, this is a threat to nation statehood. That's what I'm saying. It, it, I appreciate, it. and and there are elements that could be considered uh, in that regard. But but I think the the uh, the benefits that it can bring to nation state are tremendous. And I don't think people are fully understanding or appreciating the technology and what you can do with the technology if they just see shadows. And uh, this this is a great and I, and I appreciate that's their job and that was your job to to constantly you know protect our backs by spotting those shadows and there definitely are a lot of shadows in in this industry but on the whole it, it should be a marvelous uh, uh, boon of good um, and that's what I think about it you know I, I I've seen too much in the third world where people have been utilized. Um, you know, people's lives have been utilized. You know, you only need to look at Congo example, where 5 million people died in the 1990s um, to keep prices low in terms of their raw materials. You know, basically that's it in a nutshell, mm. right? So I can see that, but, but that's not how people, unfortunately, people with power sometimes think. They like the fact that 5 billion people died so I can have all of the cobalt that I require. You know, at a very cheap price by just paying off one warlord. You know, that's how people think, unfortunately, who run, who have power. And I don't think and, that's and, right, and it, but that's what happens. And, and, and herein lies the beauty of the situation or, or of what we're seeing. We're seeing communities all over the world pop up uh, to, and now they have the, the ability to galvanize as a community, raise funds. Uh, put together um, the, these, you know, wonderful new organisations. Um, uh, use decentralised finance as a as a mechanism for uh, um, buying their own local assets and building uh, cooperatives mm. using crypto. Mm -hmm. um, and we're seeing these popping up everywhere. And um, and why does it benefit the whole? Well, it benefits the whole because we're actually seeing capital efficiency at play without these bad actors clogging the system this is yeah. this is pure capitalism so um 
the, the two, three trillion dollars that walked into this market did so knowing that it was unregulated and at, uh, and at high personal risk. And yet still they do it. Yes. So, so I, I mean, and you see that continuing, don't you? you? You see them, you see people continuing to, if you will, support by thinking that they might what? get rich quick or support because they support the the ideal which which would it be do you reckon or is it a mixture of both yeah uh, it's a it's a real mixture so so uh, this is such an easy technology to part- participate in yeah and especially if you're young and if you're you know uh, haven't had access to education um uh, and we look at some countries like nigeria who are absolutely killing it on the mm-hmm. um on cryptocurrency and and building wonderful businesses and wonderful uh, uh, new technologies and um, overcoming years of economic challenges. And so uh, pretty much anyone can uh, participate in some of these new projects. They learn the skills. They can, uh, if they've got a, access to a computer, um, they can learn the skills and get involved and get paid very, very quickly and get paid in US dollars. Now, I believe that Vietnam's doing it um, at st- country state level where it's educating its people towards this and they're bringing projects about um that is more state focused to bring the projects out is that true or yeah for sure there's uh, many uh, um areas in the second and third world that these the governments are are seeing the potential of this and are participating and and it's really um it's really a challenge to the IT dominance of a certain uh, couple of countries that we're mm-hmm. seeing this. And it's really, you know, as a result of some pretty bad behavior that some of the big IT companies that have participated in, both uh, in, uh, in how they've abused their power to maintain a monopoly, but also in how that they've commercialized uh, some of the information and data that they've received in, in what can be argued unethical ways, and people are tired of that. So yeah. whether they're creating these server farms all over the world where people can use cryptocurrency to rent space or whether they're creating these communities where they're buying assets, real-world assets for trading or farms in order to control um, the, 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 you know, the local uh, grain production, um, they're using it through these organizational structures. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with something called DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations. No, please explain. I mean, the listeners are going crazy. It will be for, so for what you say. Well, this is a new phenomenon and, and it's really people getting together with an idea and a project and they form, they form these rules around how this community should be governed and they are coded on a blockchain. Mm-hmm. And so everyone can see that any transactions that occur with these DAOs um, are fully open and transparent, and the community gets to participate in the decisioning by holding the tokens of the DAO. And right. then they can vote on decisions. And uh, some of them are very decentralized, some of them are central, you know, hybrids, some of them are actually run by uh, um, in some cases tyrants others <laughs> benevolent dictators i mean we're seeing we're seeing uh, uh, all sorts of political systems play out with these DAOs, but but they're a wonderful new type of decentralized corporation so in the in the world of sustainability there is uh, one DAO that i participate in which is um trying to create upward pressure on the carbon offsets. So this Mm -hmm. DAO as a community buys carbon offsets from the market and puts them in a treasury and issues coins that are backed by the value of carbon offsets. So if I hold those coins and I invest and buy more coins, that money goes towards buying carbon offsets from the market. And now they have a central store of carbon offsets, which they plan on trading. But at the same time, it's creating upward pressure in the market. So people who believe in participating in some way using uh, crypto for climate change can participate in these type of DAOs. They're fully automated. And and we have other types of DAOs which are money lending. Uh, So I I can deposit my Ethereum 
into a DAO. I can borrow against that Ethereum. Um, I can borrow a stable coin. I can use that stable coin for investing. And the interest goes to the DAO participants. So we're seeing... So you can borrow, sorry, you can borrow only crypto or you can borrow fiat currency? You can borrow fiat. You can borrow fiat. So long mm-hmm. as you have an asset that you can deposit, then you can borrow against it. And, you know, initially we saw uh, some some traditional banking services and, and companies coming into this market, but DAOs that distribute the profits of the organization to the DAO token holders uh, tend to be a lot more successful and are being right. uh, governed by the community. Now, that is a those organizations are a huge challenge to how we consider uh uh, our current both banking world mm. and also our, our, how we think about you know, um, the economy and how the economy works. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And, 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 and the thing is, you've explained cryptocurrency, which is great. We've come along the blockchain and, you know, in my layman's simplicity, we, we, we say it's electronic ledger. Uh, um, what are the smart contracts, though? Sorry. No, no, sorry. I was just going to say, because we looked at the decentralization, but what I'm trying to figure out now, if everything's decentralized, what, who's controlling the smart contracts and what, well, what are they really? Sure. So, um, and this goes down to, back to your uh, question of who is best. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and so, you know, I'll, I, I will share some of my bias, but uh, so what is a smart contract now? So think of this decentralized ledger and within, and it's set up in blocks and those blocks are linked together in chains. And so uh, each block uh, um, has the number of the preceding block. And so they form a nice big line. Mm-hmm. And so in order for you to, you know, access uh, and impact uh, one uh, node you've got to impact them all and you've got to know where the information is in a particular block and you've got to change it all so so within a block i can put a little piece of code that does something and it can either um uh, and it's it's a full coding language so in the, in in my world we call it a cheering complete language so it's Sorry, a full you, coding when, language. Uh, can you can you explain that to listeners what you mean by a full coding language so I can write complex logic into a block in a blockchain. So it's a piece of code. So it could be a function. It could be a, the description of uh, an asset. It, it could be a program. So, for instance, uh, I might see that I have this uh, treasury wallet. And at the first of every month, I'm going to pay my staff. Uh, against a, uh, um, a database of uh, lots of uh, different types of uh, settlement structures. So mm-hmm. I can write a piece of code that using you know, some, some really clever protocols can communicate with an off-chain database, look at how I'm going to distribute the money, and then this code can distribute the money automatically to everyone's wallet. So I can define a full a program on chain and okay. that program could call other programs and so i can start building really complex programs by storing little pieces of code on chain in a distributed way mm-hmm. and the beauty of that is just as the transaction is appended and can never be changed so the code is the same so what it creates by default is a universal library of different types of smart contracts that anyone can see and use and, and work with. But also uh, it, it creates immutability for the event. Now, I was just going to ask and you so, that because, sorry, sorry I've just started because I'm just thinking how listeners might pick up on it. I was just going to ask you, in, 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 you said the, the, the code is written for the contract, for the smart contract. It's put onto the chain. Others can see it and I guess utilize it like a piece of paper, like a, um, a pro forma contract and, and write the bits in that they want. The problem I have, and I think people will think the problem they might have is most people can't write this stuff. 
most people have no understanding about writing any code. So, sh so when you're trying to pick this contract off the, um, you know, like a contract off the internet that says, oh, this is how you do a contract for, I don't know, a divorce or something, yeah, or to sell your property. You know, you see them on the internet. Now you can get any form. The problem today, that form's dead simple. It's in plain English and you read it and you just put your bits in it and you send it off. If it's in code, how do we, how does Joe sort the normal guy, Josephine sort the normal woman, how do they utilize it? Or do we always have to go to somebody to trust somebody who says they're writing this for us, what we think they're writing, but they may be writing something completely different. I mean, that's the problem I have now. It's the trusting of the smart contract. How does that work? Yeah, and, and again, great. Uh, so smart, I'm not sure that the term smart contract is an, is an appropriate term. So think of it as a piece of code that sits on a blockchain that's immutable. So how do we trust it? Well, we have distributed applications or dApps that use those. So you as a user, uh, you don't have to participate in actually reading the code. The application will do it for you just the same way that you don't read the code behind your mobile phone apps, True. you don't care, True. you know it works. In the same way with blockchain, there are verification uh, uh, companies who audit smart contracts and a lot of the legitimate uh, um, dApps on chain have audits. Um, those audits have mechanisms for when the protocol tries to make changes to the contracts. A lot of these contracts are, um, or the protocols are locked. Um, and so there's a time lock. Uh, so any changes that they wanna make by rerouting to other smart contracts or changing some of the, the uh, underlying how the, the DAT works, they have to go through a time lock. And so there are periods okay. where these other firms review. So there is a whole ecosystem of people answering that question of how do we- Validation really. A validation process is what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, uh, absolutely. How do we make it? How, so the whole point of being a trustless state is that we trust the math, not the individual or the right, institution. Okay. And and um, it's a bit like, you know, one of my old jobs, I used to work in a credit rating agency and we would issue an opinion. Well, if we trusted the math, we wouldn't really have to have an opinion. Mm. And so we need to get away from, from an opinion and, and do a mathematical basis of trust for pretty much anything. Um, now, so going back to your question, which, which is, you know, who is going to win? So Ethereum really were the first ones who said, look, we can use smart contracts. And, and that was the game changer and why I like it. Now, now, of course, there are better blockchains. There are faster blockchains. Um, there are blockchains that have uh, the process more transactions per second. None of that matters. All right. If really the, the best technology won, then we wouldn't be using this, the technologies that we have on our phones and PCs today. The best technology never wins. Got you. I can't okay. think of a period of time in history where I've seen the best technology win. And this mm -hmm. might be slightly controversial, but it's about liquidity and capital and where, mm -hmm. where that's going. And right now, Ethereum has won. It, it is the most dominant player when it comes to establishing new uh, applications. Now, to answer your question about Polygon and these other chains, so Ethereum is a layer one. So what we mean by that is that that's where we enter and where we typically exit transactions or where we record transactions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an ecosystem of itself. Now, Polygon is what's called a layer two. So okay. the purpose of a layer two is to sit on a layer one and give it scale and speed. Right. Okay. So the underlining works is basically Ethereum. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. They all use uh, a Ethereum virtual machine. Layer two is using Ethereum virtual machine, machine. But many of these chains have different qualities or properties, more security or faster transactions or cheaper transactions and you have roll-ups where you can trade on another platform like polygon and then you can settle through ethereum and on a batch basis or so you can record consolidated transactions trade in and through ethereum and use the roll-up techniques of polygon and i'm using polygon there are others but mm -hmm. you know 
polygon, I think is, is probably one of the more advanced. Um, and so Ethereum has this wonderful ecosystem of layer ones and layer twos that, that is just expanding very, very quickly. So where we have other layer ones like Cardano and Avalanche and, and these types of things, they will thrive and they will succeed. But we have in, in the uh, most of the big enterprises looking at Ethereum today. And, uh, and, and I think we can call it and say Ethereum has, has dominated and won. Its so, governance model is better. So what you're saying is the first to the market basically won the day. Uh, uh, well, that... technologies typically take about 10 years to mature. Right. And if you look at Facebook, I mean, Facebook is Facebook the best technology? I, I don't think so. Most people don't want to use it anymore. But um, they were there. They created a yeah. dominant foothold. And the network effect is powerful. Yes. Ethereum has by far the best network effect. If we look at, um, if we look at um, uh, Google, was you know, so so does 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 Google have the biggest dominance in search? Absolutely. Are there different search engines that do the job more uh, anonymously that don't commercialize you as your, you know, your data in such a, an aggressive way? Absolutely. And yet they are dominant. Mm. And I think we we see ourselves in a situation where Ethereum is dominant, which is why I believe that we will see it flip Bitcoin as a source of value. Now, this is this is this is the the, the drum time. When you say you see it overtaking Bitcoin, is that Bitcoin dropping or is it Ethereum rising above where Bitcoin is? Because that's a big difference, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it is. And, and honestly, um, I, it's not going to take much in terms of Ethereum price going up and market use before its total market cap will be bigger than that of Bitcoin. Now, so Bitcoin you don't see may... Bitcoin falling then? You see Bitcoin staying where it is, but Ethereum I, uh, coming yeah. up? Ethereum coming up. So uh, will Bitcoin always be a source of value? I don't know, but it has such a strong following. Yes. And um, uh, and again, network effect. And it is a source of value that has made a lot of people uh, very, very rich very quickly. Yes. And, and so that that's not going away anytime soon and and now you have these new etfs coming in i, I think bitcoin is here to stay quite frankly uh, but i do think as a as a use case for how the business world banking world and the economy largely is going to change ethereum is going to be the distributed supercomputer for the new internet or web 3.0 as we call it now that's the thing i wanted to ask you do we need um, because I, I read a little bit upon this, obviously, when I was going to talk to you and stuff like that, and, and, I, and I've looked a little bit into it uh, as well uh, after my uh, lack of capacity in thinking beyond the pale on Bitcoin and, and missing out on one of being one of those people who could have made many millions. You, you, and about, you, you and me both. You and me both. Literally, I think it was about when this guy said to me, literally no more than about $3. I'm being serious. That's what I think it was at. So you can see how much I've lost out. But anyway, so I have read up on it since a little bit. Um, but the question was is, do we have computers fast enough to deal with the whole computerization of the world, which is basically what the blockchain can do, as I understand it, restart the world again uh, with what you say using this chain. Now you've explained it even better, so I understand it even more. So... Basically, putting this ledger now, I can call it, this ledger together, and basically everything that's built, you know, I can I can foresee, you know, you're in you you're in some country, and uh, um, as is often in uh, some parts of the third world, you know, somebody else comes in, takes over power, and next minute you've lost everything you've ever had. Well, if everything's recorded, then even if it's destroyed. So your building's destroyed. You don't lose the land because it's all recorded. And nobody can nick the files and say, well, that never belonged to you, my friend, because it's somewhere else. So I can see how it makes a massive difference. But my question is, do we have the computerized power to do this? So, uh, so a blockchain is a store of transactions mm -hmm. and a store of, of things that represent assets. They don't. 
It's not a store of data in, in a traditional way, like a database. So its its load is actually very light. Its data All load right. is very light. So I've misunderstood um, then, because I was thinking that if, if you know, instead of having, I don't know, one registry or whatever, uh, you just put that all on the blockchain. I would have thought. Is that not the way it works? Well, well. So, so the way that you would you would have it. So, text isn't isn't a big uh, load on a data server. True, know? true, true. Um, uh, so, a lot of uh, where we're needing a lot of a lot of data, we might transact on the blockchain, and we might use things that represent that data. And we might use it as a mechanism for protecting the security of that data as we transfer it across. Mm -hmm. But the data resides outside of the chain, it, or it can reside in distributed file systems in servers that are accessed from the blockchain. So there are a number of technologies that are um, appearing to create distributed file servers, but at the moment, most of the data is stored in a in a in traditional databases and we're seeing we're seeing those worlds merge so everything will become fully decentralized now okay. the thing with decentralization and this is this is kind of at Nehru, my my gig in the company i work for specializes in this so so if i've decentralized the data then the load bearing is distributed then i can i can decentralize the things I do with the data, the pieces of code, and I can apply resources directly to an individual uh, service call or piece of code rather than to a whole application. So it's actually a lot more efficient. So to put it in the real world, so if you have your Excel uh, on your laptop and, and your macro is, is killing your laptop, you go out and buy a new uh, um, laptop with more memory, in order to run your Excel with macro. Well, that's a really inefficient use of resources. What you want to do is go, well, Matt, your laptop's not doing anything. Can I just borrow a bit of your memory to put to my macro? Now, right. in a decentralized data world, I can be really efficient in how I use resources. Right, right. You see, I, I, again, it may be me coming from my area. I mean, years some, some years ago, I was working um, in counter-terrorism um, in um, security intelligence service. And um, I was a case officer. So my job was basically to look at um, individuals who, I'm thinking as I'm saying it because I don't want to give anything away, obviously, who we thought might be involved in, in terror. And, you know, if you wanted to recruit somebody to be inside that organisation, because you want to know what's going on. You don't just want to know a one-off because a one-off things can happen. You want to know a continuum. So you want to recruit people that can tell you what's going on. So that takes quite a long period of time and you want to look at everything, what they're doing. You want to understand what they're, what they're about. You know they're involved in this organisation, but you think you can turn them to your advantage. Let's argue that. That's, that's the way it goes. Now, what you might, and, and then you might get a feel on somebody who you think is involved in terror, right? Great. And in my day, what would happen is my analysts and other people would come to me and say, uh, Carlton, this is what we've got on this guy. And uh, this is the telephone number they use. And, you know, we've gone to GCHQ, which would be NSA from the United States. And, you know, they, you know, they can look at this telephone number and this guy's called this guy and then he's called that guy and then he's called this girl and then he's called that person and then he's called that person. And, you know, as the case officer, you'd look at that and you'd say, right, so what I think I need to know then is those 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 people who this phone number has gone through to, okay? For the reasons that I've just explained, so I can get a feel. And so those would be put on the system and those could be listened to the system. Now, I'm not telling you anything that isn't known. In about 2016, uh, earlier, earlier, 2014, President Obama had to apologize to Germany because the NSA was basically listening into every German MP um, mm. and all the way up to the Bundeskanzler, okay, up to the, the Chancellor herself. But people thought, oh, what's that? And then, of course, it came out, all because of the same man, Snowden, that uh, basically every telephone call coming out of Spain was listened to by the NSA. Every telephone call. Right. So what I'm saying is when I was some years ago 
being circumspect and looking at blah, 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 20, 50 people. Now you just say, put them all on. And the problem with telephone numbers is you know that's exponential because, you know, one person talks to another person before you know it, you've got a million people people are talking to. That's the capacity they have because it's centralised. My point is to you, if it's decentralised, how do you get that capacity? Yeah, it's a, it's a fabulous question. So, uh, and this is that balance between privacy and security that professionals like yourself have to make the decisions on all the day. Uh, and, um, you know, and I appreciate what you have to do and what you had to do in those situations. And that's, that's a, a judgment call. Um, with, with the blockchain world, I can make my transactions as open and public as I want, or as invisible as Correct. I want. Correct, it's invisible. Yes, exactly. And that's a and, good thing and, for some reasons, but a bad thing for others, yeah? Well, it, it is. And um, like all technologies that are transformational, we just have to find ways to, uh, to adapt. And perhaps if we remove some of the causes of why people need to participate in terror uh, by, by giving people meaningful roles and jobs and economies that they can live in and, and of course we'll always have bad actors and uh, uh but but i think yeah. Matthew, you're right it's chicken and egg you, you, you look many people think they've got an absolute legitimate cause to do what they're doing you're absolutely right matthew and 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 that's a that's problematic it, it goes without saying but some causes are just down to belief mm. And it becomes particularly problematic when the down to belief aspect is religious in orientation. Yeah. And, and, I, and I put no aspect of what that religion is because it's only belief then. Nothing else. It's total belief. Yeah. Uh, ideology. Um, Correct. And uh, so, yes, blockchain can be used. Uh, for harm in terms of moving large sums of money around invisibly to fund bad actors or, uh, you know, money laundering is obvious uh, in terms of, you know, it's mm -hmm. really easy at the moment. So if you want to pay me for something, you say, go, go and buy a picture of a pet rock. I buy a picture of a pet rock and you pay me a hundred thousand dollars for Good. that. I was just going to ask you about NFTs. You, you, you're, reading <laughs> yeah. my, you're reading my mind. I just going to ask you about NFTs. So tell me, please, you just hit yeah. on it. And you won't know this, Matthew, because I'm looking at the timings because of the program and we've just run through nigh on an hour. So I, I've got to condense it. But so can you tell me about NFTs? Because this is blowing up in the United States, isn't it? Well, NFTs are actually a really, they have huge amounts of use cases for them, legitimate oh, right. use cases. So, so an NFT, non-fungible tokens, so there's, there's, there's coins and there's tokens and there are fungible tokens and non-fungible tokens. Now, oh, you have to explain. You have to explain. Something, so, I, sorry, I know. It's, uh, so a fungible token is a, uh, something that can be swapped of, of, for something else of an equivalent of value, like US dollar right, is a okay. fungible exchange of value. And so uh, I can create a, you know, a new token, beer token for when we go out, we want to keep, <laughs> keep uh, a, an account and a ledger of how much you know, Timothy is really spending. Mm -hmm. um, we can use our beer coins as a mechanism for tracking that. And I can create that. By, by creating a fungible token. So that's a okay. piece of code that describes what the token is that sits on the blockchain and issues tokens based on certain schedules, et cetera. And I can control that. So I can create my own token. Now a non-fungible token is also a piece of code. And so it is a way that sits on the blockchain, but it is a standard by which I can describe and put value to something. So. Um, I can describe a car, and if you and I agree that that is an that fungible token is a, is a legitimate ownership right for that whole, that vehicle, and that if I own that token, I own that vehicle, then you and I can trade tokens that represent real world assets, and I can get really clever in how I set up my token structure for NFTs. So at the moment. Simplistically, it's being used as a mechanism for moving art and, and certain types of assets mm. to represent that. 
but in more complex scenarios, it's able to replicate real world events. So for instance, if I'm selling a mobile phone from America to Germany and the mobile phone is being manufactured in China, then, then I care when the money transfers to buy that mobile phone and also when the good arrives. So I can represent the mobile phone in multiple different ways on a blockchain. So I can track the ownership, the settlement and the item. And then I can actually track the individual components of the item as I build up from my bill of materials to my final goods. So that at any point in time, I can see the cost build up of how that item was put together. And, and so simplistically, there was a blockchain that was developed uh, years ago called the wine blockchain, and it was to deal with counterfeiting. And so it tracked the bottle, uh, the production of a bottle of wine in Italy from the vineyard right the way through to the supermarket. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so you knew if you go onto some, certain Italian wines today and you look at the barcode and you snap the barcode at the back of the wine or the QR code rather, it gives you the history of that blockchain, of that, of that bottle of wine using NFTs to represent that batch of wine. So they have marvelous real world usage right. outside of the simplistic, uh, I'm buying a pet rock, I'm issuing a picture of a pirate. And, and so some of those NFTs that are coming out now actually do things they generate yeah. income they are they participate they give you membership into certain investment pools or, or funds so think of it as an nft as a, another piece of code that sits on the blockchain that that can describe a standard of of how we transact re digital representations of assets right See, because what i was going to ask you when i didn't realize the real world element is, is that how can you turn around and say that this NFT is mine in terms of if I draw a rock or I draw, I don't know, my symbol example for the Black Spy podcast, how can I say that's mine? How, how can I articulate that? Because somebody else can say, well, I drew that. It's in your wallet. Uh, if it's in your wallet, you own it. And, and we have a history. If you sell it to me, let's say you create an NFT of your symbol, which you should, and, uh, uh, and you, you will store that NFT in your wallet and everyone can see that that's your wallet. And if you sell it to me, everyone now knows that I have it. Or you can create derivative instruments of that NFT, or you, know, you can create copies, but hold the master copy and sell me a copy and I can have a digital certificate that says this is a legitimate copy from you based on the original. And there's only ever a thousand copies that are, or 10,000 copies that are ever going to be made of this symbol. And I have the digital rights to use that in the following areas. All of that can be associated right. to the data with the, with the NFTs. So. I guess you know why I'm asking you this, because I'm hearing that Meta are building worlds where people are buying in a, nfts in a world that's not real and I, I, I it's difficult for me to understand that the digital digital real estate um and it's going is, from thousands if not hundreds of thousands in fact i had someone a million of, of, of dollars i can't i, yeah, I don't there's, understand there's, it. there's quite a few of these these meta projects that are starting there i mean they're based on the on the thesis that, that people are going to spend part of their time in this digital environment, you know, a bit like the, the Matrix, um, where they're going to work and play and do these types of things. We, we are starting to, well, I mean, we know that online gaming is huge, but we, and, you know, the community effect on that is, is massive. Putting that into a VR world or, or a um, augmented reality world where we're seeing where you can participate, you know, see the real world and then see this augmented meta world uh, blend into your world um that there, there will be things and functions and services and economies that will explode in these em environments we don't quite know what they are yet but people are buying land mass in, in this and uh, and we've seen it all before um and there's a lot of them springing up yeah i, I think i think they're here to stay uh, you think I, you do you know, okay so it, it's not so i'm i'm, I'm again 
like Bitcoin, I'm out of the game. I'm sort of saying it's a Ponzi scheme when you're saying, because <laughs> for me, you could always make more land. I mean, you know, if you're in, if it's not a real world, you can always make more buildings. Precisely. So there are tokens that are tokens that govern how this new world is going to work. And those are the tokens that I'm interested in rather than buying, you know, digital London in some of these places. I'll leave that for people who, who want to buy digital London and there will be, you know, kudos to that. Um, so, yeah, well, I mean, we're faced with, with the reality of the digital world uh, encroaching on our real world and vice versa. Mm. I mean, Matthew, this is a fantastic position to end unfortunately um i think we've only touched the surface of this um and I, I know i've asked a lot of you to go through a lot of different things but you know i know not guessing i know that people listening do not understand so the whole idea of the show today was to allow people to understand and how that as you just said how the digital world's encroaching into the real world how this world that you're in and creating, how it is in the real world of geopolitics and secret intelligence, how that is actually working already. Um, to me, it was ideal to have you to explain that because I think unless you're in it, really all we're getting is the backwash of Bitcoin's worth this much today and now is dropped and it's worth that much. That's really what we're getting but I thought there was more to it, and you've explained how much more there is to it. And frankly, how much of this is going to take over much of our lives? If I'm right in saying that, I think that's what I've taken away from this talk. Well, there are some killer applications for this technology now. There is a, an online economy that's generating real income and real profits. There are massive use cases for a distributed and decentralized computing and and the exchange of value in both uh, currency and uh, assets uh, it's here to stay in my mind and it's going to be very much a part of our life and 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 i would encourage your your listeners especially if they're young you know get involved this is an exciting time and right now people are needed in every field whether you're a designer or a coder, or just someone who enjoys game of games and, and gamifying things, or someone who, who is an investment banker who, who wants to understand how to build new types of financial instruments using all of this. It, it's a brave new world. That was going to be my question, actually, the last question. How do people get into it um, to obtain knowledge like yourself, and you just said that, uh, rather than you know just be an, an actor behind the floor if you were just following the floor it, it's just how do people get ahead of it like you have and um you know if you could say one course just very quickly what course should somebody take in order to get ahead of the game so uh start with the basics youtube lots of free information okay. and uh, start with what is what is uh, blockchain right and okay. then move move on to more structured uh, the, the world needs solidity coders at the moment. So solidity is the language uh, for people. So solidity course. There's okay. so many out there. And then ten dollars or ten pounds will buy you huge amounts of knowledge uh, on many of these online universities. Udemy, uh, Udemy uh, is a fantastic one to start. Mm -hmm. And then here, here is the beauty of it. There are so many of these projects, um, uh, so many of these online projects that are popping up, uh, getting onto things like Discord and Telegram and going and talking to the developers. Many of these projects are running online free coding courses right. or they'll hire you if you can draw or create NFTs or, or, or paint. They need graphic artists, they need designers, they need mathematicians, they need game theory experts. So many of these big projects are desperate for resources right now and will pay you to sit in your pajamas at home and they'll pay you substantially to participate in building this new economy right so who who would just for who would who would you contact so you said it's 
basically on Telegram you can see it, and where else? You said another place. Uh, Discord, Discord and Telegram are, Discord. are really where these communities are, are exploding. So these are, you know, online chat forums. Yeah. So, yeah. so learn about blockchain, learn about what the types of different um, uh, platforms do, learn the technology, then find a project online, you know, Google, um, watch uh, um, the types of projects that are expanding, do a bit mm -hmm. of research, and then join the Discord associated with that project and just go and talk to the community. Brilliant, brilliant. All of the, the, all of the big uh, projects online have social communities that you can connect with and explore, participate. And if you're useful and if you have talent, they, they, the community will gladly hire you. And, um, or, or you could go a traditional route and uh, get yourself to college, get on the right course, get in a good company that's participating and learn through that, through that mm. route. There's plenty of opportunities out there. Plenty of opportunities. Brilliant. I'm going to leave it at that. Matthew, thank you very much for your time. Brilliant. Ladies Pleasure, sir. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here. And also we give you job advice <laughs> additionally in, <laughs> in the future world, not what's gone by. It's no good being a lorry driver. Believe me, all the cars are going to be automated. This man's telling you what the future is. So this is how you need to go forward. So thank you very, very much, Matthew. Great time. Ladies and gentlemen, see you again next week. If you'd like to help Carlton keep producing the Black Spy podcast and receive episodes and information that's only available to Carlton's special Patreon agents, then you can donate as little as £3, €4 Euros, or $5 a month by signing up with Patreon. See the Black Spy podcast notes or Google Patreon Black Spy podcast and pledge your monthly amount. You can even win the opportunity to be a guest on the show. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to subscribe for free. Here is a working class spy telling his stories, the secrets, the lives of spies. Feel free to message Carlton King on all socials and give this show five stars on Apple iTunes and subscribe so you never miss a single episode for your ears only. I was a member of the Majesty's Secret Intelligence Service.